welcome to Film Club Film Show of 2018. I'm your host, Brenda O'Neill, here with um, analyst and fellow experts, <laughs> T.Y. and Harriet Hunter. Uh, here we're, we're going to do a genre study on the genre of dystopia films, looking at four films, Alphaville, Born in Flames, The Matrix, and Blade Runner 2049. A noir, a sci-fi that doesn't look like a sci-fi, and it has everything in between. We're going to be talking about Alphaville first. Well, I think it's got some really obvious ones in it. Um, I don't know if it's different, but I think that Natasha is um, a femme fatale, which is obvious throughout it. Um, you've got Lemmy Caution, who just breaks of all those stereotypes of a um, coal detective, you know cigarette smoke, all that sort of stuff, um, that just is one of the many tropes that is in the um, film noir category. So yes, um, Alphaville is a lot like um, other dystopian and sci-fi films. It has dehumanisation, it has yeah. political oppression and totalitarian governments, often ruled by AI, much like the AI in Alphaville. It, um, Many of the people within Alphaville have no independence outside of their work and their purpose within the city, which is very much like a lot of other oppressive dystopian settings. I think the most obvious one was the aesthetic of the film. It was very monochrome, so oh, yeah. everything was like real dark. For it to be sci-fi, I think that the way they did it was was it being shot in Paris, they had a lot of the futuristic architectural buildings and gloomy setting. It differed from other films such as 2001 Space Odyssey, how the, all their setting was really just the obvious what you would think of when you do futuristic things. I do agree with you wholeheartedly on the um, aesthetic and the whole mm. monochrome and the use of like shadows throughout. Um, yeah. But I think that also ties into the whole um, film noir as well, the mm. use of the shadows and sort of hiding the shadows type thing with the cigarette smoke sort of billowing out of the shadows. I feel like that that also is almost a crossover of the genres and shows um, I think it was done the like yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. It wasn't unintentional, it was there for a reasonable effect. Circles are really present in Alphaville, so the whole town is circular, the hotel suite he stays in, you know, like the staircase. And when Alpha 60 says time is like a circle, which turns endlessly, I think that represents the tyranny of the city. It's never progressing forward. And then just staying in some sort of limbo where they don't really question anything further, they just accept what's being presented to them. Natasha von Braun says, she says that she seems convinced that the world is the same everywhere else. That in the Outlands, it's just like Alphaville. They have no knowledge of everything, of anything. And they don't understand anything besides what is going on in their lives. Barely anyone's seen it, barely anyone likes it, but we're going to talk about it. Next up is Bonnie Flames. Maybe um, to do with, say, politics in the US, um, the whole Trump, like, it's inevitable. Um, yeah. But with Trump being elected, it sort of puts the far right into the spotlight. And it's sort of, you know, all the um, actions that have been done by the far right, you know, there's a lot of which aren't amazing right now in America. Um, the far right that is not right in general. Um, it sort of it's left the um, left wing politics to sort of gain some popularity in the shadows of the spotlight on the far right, and that was shown in the election with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders had a huge sort of um, vote going for him, but obviously Hillary Clinton um, overall. overall in their party had got the vote, but as there is that sense of socialism creeping into the US which is notoriously capitalistic, 
um, and people like Bernie Sanders, it's a pretty unorthodox approach for US politicians to be opposing free tertiary education or free healthcare. Um, it's, yeah, it's not generally done in the US. So I think there is that sense of socialism creeping in that is shown in Born in Flames. So do you think that that relates anything to the many debates and arguments that the characters have throughout the film? Where they discuss the different things that they're doing, whether it's right or wrong? Um, yeah, but I could also, you could also say that it's just the moral conflict of whether or not the um, current bad that they're doing will be, or the debatably bad, the current bad for the greater good, exactly. Um, you know, it depends what way you look at their actions. Yeah. But she got they're that? sort of based, they're sort of trying to justify it upon the outcome as opposed to their current actions. Because the film was low budget, I think that really showed in the way that they made it. There was no, like the cuts were really harsh. And that kind of made it hard for me to watch and like gain my attention as well. And I kind of thought that it seemed like a documentary. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, rather I'd, I'd struggled to I struggled to get into yeah. it, to be honest. I found it a hard one to... Mm get the ball rolling with. I heard it more like a documentary than a sci-fi film as well. Um, it does incorporate that sense of futurism that is seen throughout the, va the vast majority of the films that we've studied. Um, I do think that, yeah, that sense of futurism is definitely in there. Um, but it's not an obvious one. It's, it's almost like the overall commentary of the film is futurist, futuristic um, in terms of the fact that I feel like it's more, definitely more futuristic political almost as opposed Not, to like, your 100% um, and yeah I think that's what it really that I think that's the only true um, classic sci-fi trope that is really in there um, I personally don't really see too many other ones that are creeping in there apart from the uh, slight dystopia that's going on with the, oh well not slight, the dystopia that is going on um, yeah, I at agree the time with in the film. And when it comes to whether the director did this on purpose or not, I think this is just a hypothesis or a theory, but if she did have the funding if she had the means, I think she could have very well have made it much more sci-fi. Yeah. But she was facing many, many restrictions, which made it legitimately impossible to create that atmosphere. And which is why we can kind of give her a break on that. <laughs> we can kind of forgive it. But then you always know the director wouldn't have wanted to put her name on something if she wasn't proud of that as a final product. So. But I, I do understand where you're coming from yeah. about the lack of budget to incorporate any... Showed. Yeah, 100% it definitely showed. I think the one that I really noticed was Plateau's theory of the cave. So it just basically talks about um, the reality one is surrounded by is what they believe to be true. So he said that if, um, talks of these people that are born in a cave and they're, put, oh, they're shown like photos of, I don't know, they're presented images of people and animals, but that's all they've ever seen, so that's what they perceive reality to be. And I think that definitely shows in the film where the matrix is what everybody, believes to be the real world when it actually isn't. And then also in Plato's um, sort of analogy, when they come out of the cave, yeah. um, the light, the sunlight, means their eyes have to take time to adjust. And that is, you could draw the similarity to um, Neo when he obviously chooses the pill and he wakes up out of this whole entire life that has been a lie. Um, you could, you could essentially say that's him coming out of the cave 
and his brain has to take time to adjust. He's in this sort of state of yeah. denial initially about how, oh my God, this, this sort of isn't reality, what's going on? Um, but then there's a sort of irony there that the cave in this analogy is the sunshine and rainbows matrix and the sunlight is um, the pretty grim and bleak world. And, and some people don't want to accept that. It's 100%. Not like the so um, it sort of just shows that it maybe it's not what it is on the surface as face value. It could be actually the overall what's happening on underneath. To me, I saw the mirrors as sort of like a metaphor for perception and boundary. Yeah. So, you know, in the same way the mirror like turns to liquid. Mm -hmm. I think it's like a dissolution of the fake reality of the Matrix. And I also noticed that when Neo meets Morpheus, he's wearing those glasses that are really reflective. And then that's before Neo takes upon and is exposed to the, like, the reality of this world. And then when he wakes up, um, Morpheus doesn't have the glasses on. And I think that kind of shows that he is now in the real world and no longer in the Matrix. So he's like, awoken. Oh, the reality. Yeah, and with that, I think that it's no coincidence that the first thing that Neo touches to realise that he is in the Matrix is a mirror. Is a mirror yeah. um, because of that almost connotation that comes with a mirror of deception, it deceives your eyes. Yeah. Um, mirrors can quite easily do that, that's what people use them for sometimes. And um, yeah, I think that the use of Neo touching the mirror first out of anything um, really sort of shatters the whole thing, how it shows that um, he has been deceived this whole time, if you think of the mirror as a sort of metaphor for deception yeah. that has been um, put on them. But I also noticed that um, whenever they go back into the Matrix, like Morpheus, Neo, Trinity, even the agents, they all have those like really mm. reflective glasses on and I think that shows, um, it's like a, what's it called? It's like a boundary between the Matrix and the reality, which only they know yeah. about. Yeah. True, yeah. No one else has those yeah. glasses apart from them. And, yeah, and you're it's right. Like they they all show. Know. They're the only ones yeah. who um, truly know. But with that, also, um, the use of mirrors could um, sort of connote this uh, uh, like enlightenment that the, their eyes have been opened, as you were sort of talking about before. Yeah. Um, and how they can now see what wasn't seen before. Because, mm. um, you know, the use of a mirror, you can see around the corner, um, you can see yourself, which you can't actually see with the naked eye. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that use of the mirror does show, and it is used to sort of connote this sense of like eye-opening and light. Yeah, like the barrier that they have. Yeah. It's rare that you come across a sequel that is equal, if not better, to the original. And we're going to talk about such a film. We're going to be talking about Blade Runner 2049. I'd say that the relationship between Officer K and Joy um, is, I feel like it is actually, an uh, almost human relationship. Um, I feel like that it does have all the qualities of a human relationship apart from the intimacy. Yeah, um, yeah I feel, and that could be, that could show that, um, you know, replicants do have the ability to feel and then um, lead on to, well, do replicants have a soul, you know, that's Officer K, that's the only reason, that's the way he justifies um, killing replicants, is that uh, they don't have a soul, so therefore they're not living. But the relationships, I feel like they are a human relationship, and it is very representative of um, human relationships. The, the, like I said before, the only thing lacking is the physical connection. I believe so too, because if you think about it, in reality, not everybody needs to have a physical connection to have that type of intimacy. Just like being asexual, so I feel like Yes, those relationships are quite, um, they do have a lot of human emotions and I don't think relationships are just based on physical, the physical aspect as well.
I find it a very one-sided relationship. Kay has grown to genuinely love this thing. Which, mm. yeah, as Harry said, it does show a sense of humanism to him. But John, on the other hand, is still most likely just programmed to say and do all the things that it does. At the same time, the hologram advertising her says that she can be anything that you want her to be. And Kay wants her to be real. And who knows what that really implies. Um, everything she's done as she's programmed to do. I do think you're right in saying that it is one-sided. But you, as the audience, you sort of can't help but almost fall in love with the relationship yeah. itself. Um, and you definitely feel that sort of palpable sorrow as um, love crushes the little uh, sort of USB looking thing that um, Joy is remotely connected to. If he breaks the stick, Joy's gone forever. And then love just emotionlessly crushes it and that is Joy gone forever. And yeah, I, I feel like as an audience you can't help but feel it's so sad yeah. for um, Officer K, because his whole entire relationship, you could call it, has just completely gone. And I feel the way that you feel from that shows that it does have definite features of a real relationship. The fact that you feel so bad for Officer K um, when love crushes. Because even though she's not real you feel the emotions like just 100%. if anyone else were to lose their loved one <clears throat> through I don't know like death or something yeah it is essentially the, the death thing. of joy yeah but the irony being he could go out and buy joy buy tomorrow one. um and but I, I feel like he'll be really, really connected to or like attached to joy as well but to the joy that he had not yeah joy not, to, not, not the program buy. it's it's a creepy humanisation, I think, that it's so accurately done. Yeah. Scarily enough. 100%. You can find stuff like that in the real world <laughs> with um, people finding an attraction to uh, 2D girls. <laughs> well, I don't feel like the film actually um, sort of clarifies what it defines as a soul. Um, I think because they focus on what? Is living. Yeah, I, I would say that Officer K um, has this subversive sort of mental conflict going on, on whether or not he can, um, whether or not he can now, after he knows what he knows about the pregnant replicant, um, I feel like in his head he's he's a bit got a bit of a moral conflict going on about his, everything that he's done now. Because his whole justification was that replicants don't have souls. That was it. Um, he said he could kill replicants because he knows that they're not living, they don't have souls. Mm. But if you can give life, then surely you must be living. Um, and so, yeah, the replicants giving birth, that just, in my opinion, uh, defines replicants as having a soul. And I think that definitely ensues a moral conflict in Officer K. Um, and I do think that shows in how when he kills Love at the mm. end of the film, he, showed, he seems to be quite upset about it. Yeah, you can see it in his face that he, yeah. he doesn't want to do it, but he has to do it. Unlike the other times where he sort of uh, emotionlessly kills um, the other replicant. To have a song... Is mainly based on the emotions that they feel. I think the soul has no actual weight, barely even exists, but it's something that the people in this universe perceive. They feel that to live, you must have a soul. And oh, they didn't actually need that. Whether. Because I've seen some people are pretty like, you wouldn't think they'll have a soul, but they're still living. Yeah, that's, that, that's what you could argue. For example, the antagonist, 
Jared I'm not sure. I can't remember his character's name off the top mm. of my head. But he seems very emotionless about the whole thing. But that's because he sees replicants as machines. He doesn't see them as humans. But yet they portray and present more human characteristics than he yeah. does. So I think that is intentional by the director as well, to show that, um, to give the audience an attachment and a sense of um, emotion towards replicants. Because when, when I think about if people have a soul and if they're just like emotionless and whatever, I'm like, well, do you even feel anything? What makes you human? Mm. To think that you can't feel I any emotion. to feel is what makes you human, in yeah. my opinion. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you for watching our film show.